Good morning. Welcome to the worship of God at First Baptist Church on this first Sunday of Lent. Can you believe that it's already March? I don't know where the year's going, but it is flying by. I'm glad you're here today uh, to begin this most important season in the church calendar uh, together as church. Um, before I make a few announcements uh, from the inside of the order of worship, this list in here, I'd like to welcome our guests today. Um, they're here for an Appalachian Immersion Week with us. They'll be staying in the Mission Wing. They already are staying in the Mission Wing. Uh, and uh, in case you hadn't put it together yet, they're Baptists. Uh, you know that because they're sitting in the back of the room back there. Um, and uh, several of you came up to me at the beginning and said, you need to get them to move down front. I said, I can't get you to move down front. They're not going to move. This group is from First Baptist Church, Auburn, Alabama. They were close but they missed the tornadoes that you all have been reading about in the news. We're so glad you're here today. We welcome all of you to worship, and we welcome Laura and Seth Edgars, who are the leaders of the group, uh, sitting in the back there. They're even more Baptists than the students are. Um, so welcome. We're so glad you're here. We look forward to getting to spend time with you this week. Now, if you'd open up your order of worship and look inside, I'd like to make a few announcements. Um, the first one is that tomorrow, Monday, March the 11th, is the Brotherhood Men's Group Meeting. Uh, that has been moved up a week to accommodate the speaker who couldn't come on the 18th, but could come on the 11th. So uh, Brotherhoods tomorrow night, all are invited. Um, I wouldn't wish it on too many people, but it's a good time, and there'll be good food, and if, if you'd like, you're invited. Emily Ayers, the director of Middlesboro Main Street, is the speaker uh, this time around. If you skip down uh, to Wednesday, March the 13th, you'll notice that on Wednesday night, in place of the pastor's Bible study, we will be spending time with our uh, guests who are back here in the back uh, with, uh, with some conversation, whatever that might look like. We'll, we'll work that out. I won't throw you under the bus or anything. Uh, and then if you skip all the way down, I want to point this out because it's unusual uh, the finance committee meeting is on the 19th this month. You would normally expect it to be this Tuesday night, and you would normally expect the business meeting to be this Wednesday night, but because our guests are here, we move those down a week uh, so that we could be more hospitable to you. Uh, so finance and business meeting are not this week, but next week. The last announcement that I have to make uh, is pertaining to this insert. I know when you picked up the bulletin and you saw it, you said, already? Already? It's time to do Easter lilies already? Yes. Uh, the florist likes to have the order in early because the florist gets orders for a million lilies. So uh, go ahead and fill this out and drop it in the offering plate so that we know how many lilies to order for Easter Sunday. Again, welcome. Welcome to the worship of God on this first Sunday of Lent. If you would, rise and pass the peace of Christ to your neighbor.
some way, shape, or form. As we begin worship, will you take your bulletin, and we'll read together our call to worship, and then we'll sing our hymn of praise, number 33, Guide Me, O Thou Great Jehovah. If you'll have both of those, and will you please stand. The God of our ancestors heard our cries and saw our oppression when we were slaves in Egypt. God brought us out with a mighty hand. The Lord, our shelter, our refuge, our dwelling place, says, When the mighty people call to me, I will answer them. I will be with them in trouble. I will show them my salvation. Throughout the season of Lent, we will heighten our collective confessions, for Lent is a season of penitence and preparation for the season of Easter that is coming. If you would, uh, keep your order of worship handy and join me and join Trish as we go through the call to confession, the prayer of confession and the assurance of forgiveness. God is faithful, leading us into freedom. We bring now our confession to the one more powerful than Pharaoh, mightier than the tempter in the wilderness. O 
O oh God, our refuge and fortress, forgive us when we fail to trust in you. We fall to temptation. We are swayed by false words. We speak false words of our own. We choose our case and comfort over you demanding claims upon us and upon the world. In turning from you, we settle for less than the abundant generosity you intend. Forgive us, we pray. Do not let us be put to shame, O oh God. Hear us as we call to you and show us your salvation. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Scripture declares, the Lord is generous to all who call on God's name. Friends, believe the good news. God does not turn away from us. We are forgiven. Thanks be to God. A reading from the book of Romans. But what does it say? The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. That is the message of faith that we preach. Because if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and in your heart have faith that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Trusting with the heart leads to righteousness, and confessing with the mouth leads to salvation. The scripture says, all who have faith in him won't be put to shame. There is no distinction between Jew and Greek because the same Lord is Lord of all, who richly gives to all who call on him. All who call on the Lord's name will be saved. Here ends the first lesson. If you would, ready your heart. Take that deep breath I often encourage you to take at this point in the service. Ready your soul to pray with me this morning. God of grace, we have gathered into this space as your church for another Sunday of worship. We have sung a hymn. We have confessed our shortcomings. We have been reminded that we are forgiven. God, we come here today relieved grateful, but not without a lot of weight in our lives. God, there are disasters that are ripping up places in the world that desperately now need help. We pray for these. God, there are divisions in our society that are ripping up our souls. God, we pray for these. 
God, there are conflicts and temptations and shortcomings and blind spots within our own being. Things that keep us from following your example, your calling to be your church and disciples in this old aching world. God, we ask that as we are here today, you will hold those for us, all of those things for us, for just a little while, that we may be able to rest, to breathe, to regroup, that we may be able to go forth from this place renewed and refreshed as your church. God, it's a big request in a world as busy as most of ours. And we won't make it if we don't pray. We pray now the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray, the prayer that we pray every Sunday together as a church, trusting that its good words will form us and shape us. We join our voices in one bold voice and pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. During Lent this year, we've chosen hymn number 169 for our Lenten hymn as our response to prayer each week. We join me as we sing it today. reading from the Gospel of Luke. Jesus returned from the Jordan River full of the Holy Spirit and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. There he was tempted for 40 days by the devil. He ate nothing during those days and afterward Jesus was starving. The devil said to him, since you are God's son, command this stone to become a loaf of bread. Jesus replied, it is written, people won't live only by bread. Next, the devil led him to a high place and showed him at a single instant all the kingdoms of the world. And the devil said, I will give you all of this, this whole domain and the glory of all these kingdoms. It's been entrusted to me and I can give it to anyone I want. Therefore, if you will worship me, it will all be yours. Jesus answered, it's written, you will worship the Lord your God and serve only him. 
the devil brought Jesus into Jerusalem and stood, stood him at the highest point at the temple. He said to him, Since you are God's son, throw yourself down from here. For it is written, He will command his angels concerning you to protect you, and they will take you up in their hands so you will not hit your foot against the stone. Jesus answered, It's been said, Don't test the Lord your God. After finishing every temptation, the devil departed from him until the next opportunity. Here ends the gospel lesson. Our hymn of stewardship this morning is hymn number 633, All the Way My Savior Leads Me. Let's stand together. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, teach us to be loyal stewards and faithful servants, remembering why we are here on this earth. We love you and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.
What's this Lent business all about? We're Baptists, not Catholics or Anglicans or Lutherans. What's the deal with this season of penitence and preparation? We're Easter people, not Good Friday people. Lent can be so dirge-like. We have to confess. You know, I don't mind the almsgiving and the praying, but what's the deal with all that fasting business? I don't, I don't care for that. What are you giving up for Lent? Well, spinach, I don't like it anyway. Yeah. Uh, what's the deal with that? What is the deal with all this Lent stuff? Sometimes I get questions like this. Seldom do they come from you in this room, but more often from Baptists in other churches in the area who are curious and perhaps a little bit suspicious of what we're up to here at First Baptist Church. Our friends at First Baptist Auburn have no idea what I'm talking about, do you? <laughs> I didn't think so. I thought I'd, on the off chance, that you might have some of those questions and just not feel up to asking them out loud. I thought I'd voice them today and begin the sermon with them. I thought I'd bring it up and talk about it on this first Sunday in Lent. First Sunday in Lent... It's the only season that uses that preposition. First Sunday in Lent, because the Sundays in Lent don't count. If you counted the Sundays, you might have done this once. You get 46 days of Lent. But there are only 40 days of Lent. Sundays in Lent are regarded as breaks in the season. As many Easter's on the way to the main event. But really, what's this Lent business all about among a Easter people anyway? I think the Christians of the past bequeathed us Lent because sometimes we Easter people feel a little bit too worthy. Sometimes we feel a little bit too worthy. We come to church, we give to CCM, we volunteer at the boys' group home and put together Christmas baskets every season, we sing in the choir, we come on Wednesday night and do Bible study, 
We serve food on Thursday night to anybody that shows up. And all of that is good. All of that is the stuff that Jesus taught us to do. And yet, because of our humanity, because of our frailty as people, sometimes we Easter people, in practicing what Jesus taught us, start to feel a little worthy. Lent, I think, is a warning sign for when we start to get smug. Lent is the check engine light on the dash of your car. You know, if, if, if you're driving an older car, maybe the check engine light stays on all the time, but, but assume it doesn't. Assume it doesn't, and Lent is like that light when it actually works. Or, or Lent maybe is the little notice that bounces around your television. Uh, you know that notice that says, user inactive for four hours. Unit will power down soon. You know that notice. They've built it into all, all the devices now. When you begin to feel yourself being worthy, that's the check engine light, and that's what Lent is for. The Apostle Paul wrote to the church in Rome, the church that would have been the most like us, folks. The church in Rome, all have sinned. Notice that. Paul, Paul didn't say some have sinned. Paul said all have sinned. All fall short. Believe it or not, these are words of grace. These are words of grace. It's Paul's way of reminding us that we are all on equal footing. That the kind of weighing and judging of this sin and that sin that marks the faith of the Pharisees and the chief priest in the ancient world, that marks the faith of far too many Christians in today's world too, well, that's way above our pay grade as disciples, that weighing and measuring all have sinned and fall short is Paul's way of reminding us of the truth that is woven throughout the Bible from Genesis all the way to maps. I, I mean revelation. I mean revelation. God loves us not because of who we are or what we've done or what we've left undone, but God loves us because of who God is. I don't really care which book you pick in the Bible, that's in there. There's not a lot of things you can say that about, but that is in there. Because of who God is, God loves us. God is love, the writer of 1 John tells us, twice. God is love. Jesus shows us over and over again in story after story after story after story where he sides with those who seek love and distances himself with those who pass judgment. Jesus shows us over and over again that God is love. A man with a skin disease is healed, a leper. A paralyzed man can walk. A tax collector is included. Fishers, you know about fishers, don't you? Fishermen, fisher people, whatever we say. You, you know about them, don't you? Yeah, they're, they're a seedy bunch. They get included. They get really included. The poor, the poor, there's a good word for them. And those who weep, there's a good word for them. And the hungry, they get fed. 
The servant, not the master, the servant. That's all kinds of backward. But the servant gets included. The demon possessed get exercised. The hemorrhaging woman whose condition relegates her to the outer class, the fringe of society, gets reeled back in. The ill-prepared 5,000, you know, those people that were so irresponsible that they're not like us. We wouldn't do this. They're so irresponsible, they follow Jesus all over the Holy Land, and then it gets dark and they have nothing to eat and their bellies are growling and they have nowhere to stay. Well, they get fed, all of them. The convulsing boy, he gets healed too. This list, this list that I put together that I just read to you, I put together by simply thumbing through the first part of the Gospel of Luke. All of that is in the first part of the Gospel of Luke. The Gospel of Luke is 24 chapters long, and all of that is in the first nine. In case some of you are accountant types, I did the math, it's 34%. There's that many stories that say God is love in the first 34% of the Gospel of Luke. I might have missed one. There might be more. I put this list together. I read through all of these stories. I read all the way up to chapter 9, and I found a story that I thought was very interesting there. I know the Gospel lesson is chapter 4. I'm coming back to that. But in chapter 9, there's an editorial heading in my Bible. It's in the Pew Bible, if you care to look. It, it says, Jesus corrects his disciples. As I'm thumbing through, I think, well, that's an interesting heading. I think I'd like to look at that story. Jesus corrects his disciples. You know this story. An argument among the 12 boils up. You know what they're arguing about? Yeah, they're arguing about the question, who is the greatest? <laughs> the, odd, the nerve of these people, right? They're arguing, who is the greatest? I can feel Jesus in this story who doesn't say anything at first, sigh from the back, uh, fr from the gut, about this. I, 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 when I hear that sigh, it runs up my spine. He goes, oh, they've missed it again. For nine chapters now and counting, I've been showing them and they've missed it again. An argument arose among the disciples. Who is the greatest? They wanted to know. You've never done that before, have you? Have you? You've never, like zealous Peter, looked down your nose at doubting Thomas? You've you never done that before, have you? Yeah. You've never, like John, the beloved disciple, as the Gospel of John calls him, thought to yourself, I'm so glad I'm not like Judas, the betrayer. Thank you, Lord, for not making me like Judas, the betrayer. You, you've, you've never done that before, have you? You've never thought as a member of the First Baptist Church of Middlesboro that we can include them not, not them. No, no, no. We, we have to draw the line somewhere, and them is too far. Their sin is greater than our sin, and therefore we are greater than them. You never thought that before, have you? You're, you're nothing like the disciples in this story, are you? Jesus responds to all of this in Luke 9 in a very wonderful way. 
Jesus takes a little child. He takes a child. Maybe it was the child that was convulsing just a few chapter or a few verses earlier. That's in the same chapter. And he brings the child over to the disciples. He takes a kid. Maybe, maybe it was the kid who the disciples tried to shoo away. Shoo, get away, kid. He's got important things to do. He takes a kid and he stands this kid right in their midst. Like in the, in the cross transom aisle back there uh, behind uh, the osmuses. Stands them right there in their midst. I can see the disciples going, what is he doing? I can see the disciples' faces start to turn a little red when they realize what they've been doing. And Jesus says to them, whoever welcomes this child, this child standing right here in my name welcomes me. You see, greatness gets us into trouble. Greatness gets us chasing after the wrong things. Greatness gets us fashioning golden calves out of all sorts of things in our lives. Greatness puts us in the place of the Pharisees and the chief priests in all of these stories. In the place of the only people in the New Testament that Jesus really goes after. You ever notice that? Greatness puts us in their place because they think they are greater than Jesus. Preacher, I hear all that. I hear the challenge of the gospel of grace that you are naming to us from Luke 9. But what about Luke 4? This is the first Sunday of Lent. We always read the temptation story of Jesus on the first Sunday of Lent. What about Luke 4? What's all that got to do with Luke 4? What's all that got to do with Lent? My answer, as I thought about that this week, is everything. It has everything to do with Luke 4 and with the season of Lent. For you see, without that piece, without that wide-angle lens of the gospel of grace in the gospel of Luke, without all have sinned and fall short, we invariably turn Lent into a time of earning something from God. That's not what Lent is for. Without that little child in Luke 9 standing in our midst with dirt on her face and her belly growling. Without whoever is the least among you is the greatest ringing in our ears. We inevitably turn Luke 4 into a story about someone else somewhere else in some other time it's not it's not that look again at Luke 4 listen again to the words that are spoken in Luke 4 since you are God's son command this stone to become a loaf of bread I will give you this whole domain. You see it? Everything the light touches, Simba. Yeah, I will give you this whole domain, all the kingdoms of the world, if. Since you are God's son, throw yourself down from here. God will send angels. It'll be glorious. Fred Craddock incisively remarks about this story. 
This is what he says. It is important to keep in mind that a real temptation, a real temptation beckons us to do that about which much good can be said. A real temptation does that. Stones to bread. The hungry people hope so. The political control, all the kingdoms of the world, the oppressed surely hope so. Leap from the temple, well, those longing for proof, they certainly hope so. And then Craddock says, all this is to say that a real temptation is not an offer to fall, but an offer to rise. Ooh. If you take nothing away from this sermon, remember that line right there. A real temptation is not an offer to fall, but an offer to rise. Since you are God's son, the tempter says. Jesus declines but he later goes on to do all the very things that he is tempted to do in the wilderness. Did you notice that? He, goes, he declines to do any of them and then goes on to do them all. You know, he, he goes on uh, to feed people, to free people. He walks on water. That's got to be as good as jumping off the pinnacle of the temple. But w- what he doesn't do his attempt to rise, to attempt to become great. Sisters and brothers, we don't keep Lent to earn God's favor. We keep Lent to get clearer about who is greatest and who isn't. That's what we keep Lent to do. The temptation of Christ is our template. That's the reason we begin the season every year with one of the stories of Jesus being tempted. Jesus is tempted, as Craddock says, with good ends, with good things. What kind of temptation is it if it's not for something that dazzles, that is attractive, he is a tempt, he's tempted with these things, and then he goes and does them, and I think leaves very little doubt about the only real temptation that is in this story, the temptation to rise to greatness, the temptation to count and weigh sins and to find others more wanting than you are. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the new Moses, the new Elijah, says no to that temptation. The only person that is worthy to say yes to that temptation says no and trades it in for ordinary, obedient faithfulness. Day after day after day, week after week, year after year, on his way to Jerusalem. He trades it in. He doesn't take it up. So what's Lent all about? It's about all that. It's about knowing that there is nothing at all that you can do to earn God's grace. Yes, we're practicing. Yes, we're praying and giving and hopefully fasting. But there's nothing you can do to earn God's grace. Lent is about knowing that any voice that says otherwise is the voice of temptation. Lent is about using 40 days of the year It's not that much. 40 days of the year to learn to distinguish the voice of God from the voice 
of the tempter. What's Lent really about? Well, it's about grace. You are God's beloved already, unconditionally, not because of who you are, but because of who God is. And God is love. Lent is the season in which we give and pray and fast in order to dislocate our routine just a little bit. Like, like Jacob's hip on the river Jabbok. In order to slow us down just a little bit like a wandering in a wilderness by Jesus so that we can more clearly hear and live the gospel of grace in our blessed, beloved, ordinary life together. Let's do this. Let's do this and trust that as we wander the wilderness, angels will meet us along the way. At this time, we come to the service of Lenten Lights. We started this tradition last year with the good help of Charlie Nagel and Roy Asher and Stan Alexander Sr., who helped us create the candelabra that sits on the communion table today. In the church year, Advent and Lent are siblings both are seasons of repentance and preparation for the highest of Christian holy days. We attend the Advent wreath at the beginning of worship. Its lights are circular and they grow and spiral inward toward the Christ candle until at last on Christmas Eve they are all ablaze. The light of the world is born. We attend the Lenten lights at the end of worship. These lights are linear, and one by one they fade, until at last on the eve of Easter, they are all dark. The light of the world has been snuffed out. The service of Lenten lights is a time set apart for you Time to ready your heart for the mystery and the miracle of Thursday's supper, Friday's cross, Saturday's deep silence, and finally, against all odds, Easter's empty tomb.
You know that to be true. And so as you go to do that work, receive this benediction, this good word of blessing that will carry you through. May the strength of Christ uplift you. The comfort of the Holy Spirit surround you. And the grace and mercy of God give you hope and give you courage. This day, and all lent long. Amen. <laughs>